The fundamental issues are, are who are we? What do we mean when we say we are the nation state of the Jewish people? What, what causes our cohesion? What binds us together? Do we share a common destiny? These are very fundamental and pressing issues that we have to address now. Because 25 years from now, I, I, I fear it'll be too late. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you are listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're very pleased to have with us historian and former Israeli ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren, to discuss his new book about the future of the Jewish state. But first, I want to remind you to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, and click on the bell for notifications. I also want to remind you that you don't have to wait a full week for more Top Story analysis. There is a daily Top Story podcast where I share more news and analysis with you about the most significant issues we're facing today. You can find The Daily Show under Top Story with Jonathan Tobin on the JNS channel on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, I'd like to let you know that JNS is on Telegram. You can find the latest news, including Top Story and other JNS TV content there, by subscribing. And now to today's program. There's no denying the fact that in many ways Israel is a mess. It is governed by a dysfunctional and arrogant bureaucracy and has an idiosyncratic political system that seems designed to ensure instability and dissension. Not to mention it has no constitution. Its government has failed to assert its sovereignty in various ways over some communities, something that has enabled chronic problems and even disasters. Its people are plagued by high taxes, a lack of affordable housing, and high rates of poverty. 20% of the population pays 92% of the taxes, and 45% of the population lives on only 17.5% of the land, most of that in greater Tel Aviv, where density and traffic problems are only growing. The fast-growing, ultra-Orthodox sector of the population has created a culture in which men do not work or serve in the military, leading to endemic poverty, as well as undermining national solidarity. Israel has alienated much of the diaspora and seems unwilling and ill-equipped to face up to the assault on its country abroad by an anti-Semitic BDS movement, as well as an international community being weaponized by those who wish to destroy it. And that's before we mention the near-civil war that has broken out on the country's streets as the losers of the last election are using their control of the nation's legal, academic, journalistic, and security institutions to try to paralyze the country to prevent a much-needed reform of the country's judiciary. The protesters say they believe the country's democracy is in peril. Meanwhile, the other half of the country worry that the if the protests succeed, it will mean that they will be essentially disenfranchised. Behind all of this is not so much an argument about constitutional issues as a cultural war in which Ashkenazi secular liberal elites fear losing power to Mizrahi religious and nationalist sectors of the population. And oh yes, there remains the century-old conflict with the Palestinians, which has left Israel in control of a large and hostile Arab population that is unable and unwilling to make peace. That's a daunting list of problems that is by no means complete. But at the same time, Israel also remains a miracle of a country. It remains powered by an idea about Jewish life, Zionism, the national liberation movement of the Jewish people, that, critics notwithstanding, remains powerful and persuasive. Utterly unique, it has thrived despite its contradictions, overcoming predictions of an early demise by becoming a regional military superpower as well as building a first world economy. Though beset by problems like the conflict with the Palestinians that have prompted prophecies of doom for more than half a century, the pessimists have always been wrong. It has thrived beyond even the most optimistic of forecasts, in spite of the lack of peace. It may not have become the normal country Zionism's founding father Theodore Herzl dreamed of, but it is nevertheless one of modern history's greatest success stories. The question now that it has celebrated its 75th anniversary of independence 
is how can it go on living with these contradictions and finding a way to keep thriving and growing as it heads towards its 100th birthday? After what has happened since 1948, only a fool would bet against Israel. But that list of problems is also growing, and that not only are the solutions to them elusive, but it's not clear that Israelis, and especially their leadership, have the wisdom or the imagination to face up to these challenges, let alone solve them. But one person who is thinking about Israel's future is historian and former Israeli ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren. He's part of a new nonprofit group called Israel 2048 that is trying to address the need to confront the future. And he's written a new book, 2048, The Rejuvenated State, that is a manifesto in which he lays out his vision and how Israel can address its ongoing challenges. And we're very happy to have him with us today to discuss it. Michael Oren was born in New Jersey, made Aliyah, served as a paratrooper in the Israel Defense Forces, became one of the Jewish world's greatest historians, writing such essential books as Six Days of War, Power, Faith, and Fantasy. He served from 2009 to 2013 as Israel's ambassador to the United States, wrote a fascinating memoir of that time, Ally, My Journey Across the American-Israel Divide, and then he was elected to Knesset, where he served from 2015 to 2019, serving as a deputy minister in charge of public diplomacy. He's also a successful writer of short stories and novels. Michael Oren, welcome back to Top Story. Good to be with you, Jonathan. Thank you for hosting me. Well, Michael, it's really a pleasure to have you back on our podcast. Uh, before we dive into some of the details of uh, 2048 Rejuvenated State, and there is a lot of substance in it to unwrap, I want to start by asking sort of the first existential question among many we're going to try to address, and the one that was sort of at the top of my mind, and that is whether, um, given everything you've written, as presently constituted, Israel is capable of facing up to its long-term and chronic problems. Your brief summary of the path to writing this book, which began when you were in government and hoped to start a national commission along these lines, but that didn't happen, and you've now created your own group. So even if Israelis are very good at listing their country's problems and certainly complaining about them, what should make anyone think that they're ready to listen to your analysis of the need to rejuvenate the Jewish state as we head toward 2048 and beyond? Well, if, it's a great question to open with, Jonathan. Thank you. I think if uh, anybody looking for evidence of the need to address Israel's future challenges doesn't have to have look any further than the last seven months. Uh, which uh, has seen this country torn apart uh, in many different directions, by the way, not just in one direction, not just between opposition and, and, and pro-government uh, demonstrators. Um, and uh, all of this was predictable. There's actually a chapter in the book about the need to reform uh, the judiciary. Uh, you you uh, have it in there, in absolutely. I, I assume that, that was written before January, but... It was written four years ago. Four years ago, <laughs> no. I was working on that issue in the Knesset. You, you did not have to be a prophet to see that coming. You don't have to be a prophet to know that unless Israel extends its sovereignty over the Negev, which is 62% of the country, and which now Israel law is not enforced, not for drugs, not for guns, not for human trafficking, and certainly not for uh, polygamy. Uh, upwards of 30% of all Bedouin men have more than one wife. Uh, it's illegal in the state of Israel. Uh, and illegal building, about 400,000 illegal structures uh, in the Negev. Uh, and no effective Israeli sovereignty over 60%, 2% of the countries. If we don't address this now, in 25 years from now, that will be an existential threat. And of course, the Haredi issue, the ultra-Orthodox issue, which is in many ways the most complex, the most sensitive, because uh, it goes to the heart of Jewish peoplehood and our, and our legacy. Um, but right now... Um, the birth rate is such that in 25 years from now, um, probably about half of all, all elementary school children in the state of Israel will be Haredi, will be ultra-Orthodox, and they'll be getting less than a second grade modern education. And that population will not be able to sustain the economy in any way. So it, that too uh, threatens the continued existence of the state. Now, the good news is the last seven months has been a huge wake-up call. It's, uh, it's kind of strange. I've been quoting General, I've been quoting Admiral Yamamoto, Jonathan, <laughs> not, not usually a source for for uh, for an for an for an analyzing contemporary Israeli politics. Uh, Admiral Yamamoto, you remember, was the Japanese admiral in charge of the attack on Pearl Harbor, 
he was against the attack. And after the so-called successful attack, he said, well, it's a success, but we've wakened a sleeping giant. Uh, and the government may succeed in some aspects of a reform, but they have awakened the sleeping giants. And the sleeping giant here is the, the very big and broad and deep Israeli center. It's center, center right, center left, which is no longer going to sit quietly um, and let ultra-Orthodox um, schools basically take down the state or let illegal um, building take down the state of Israel either. There's been a huge wake up here. And if there's any good that comes out of this, uh, it's certainly that. Well, I, you know, I can testify that you've been thinking about this even longer than four years ago. Um, I believe, um, I think the first article that I was asked to edit at Commentary Magazine when I began in early 2009 was a piece by you about Israel's existential threats, and that was just before you were named ambassador. So I know that you... Now, one of the existential threats I mentioned was the Haredi threat. I remember that. Yeah, back then. Uh, and my good friends, uh, uh, Bogia Ailon and Atan Sharansky, they were my colleagues at the Shalem Center back then, practically mm -hmm. jumped on me saying, no, the Haredim are not a threat. They're an opportunity. And yes, they are an opportunity, but they're also a threat. But what I think is most interesting about that article, and thank you for editing it so, so expertly, uh, was that one of the existential threats I mentioned was the threat of running out of water. And back then, we were running out of water. We were short 14% water of our water needs every year and growing as the rainfall fell and the population grew. And look, we overcame it. Today, nobody thinks of, of water shortage as an existential threat in this country. Other countries and parts of the United States, perhaps, but not here. And it shows you that when we focus on something, when we are determined, we can overcome existential threats. And my personal experience as someone who's lived here for 45 years, my, my perspective as a historian who looks back to you know, a certain date in May 1948, when this country came into being and we had nothing, we had no natural resources, no allies, enough bullets to fight for one week. Um, it shows what this country and what this people can do, our people can do. Uh, when our put our minds to it. Right. Well, let's start as we get into the substance of your book by confronting, um, you just mentioned it, what has been the top news story about Israel since January, the political conflict over judicial reform, which is something that you list in the book is something that must happen. The debate about this, sh this issue, as you've said, noted elsewhere, has become a culture war and not really so much a constitutional debate. Does the polarization over this issue sum up the difficulty of addressing the country's problems? I mean, you said uh, that, you know, yes, it's an opportunity because people are thinking about it. But, it you know, it, to, to read the daily coverage um, and with what may come yet, you know, it's hard to be optimistic. It is hard to be optimistic. Um, but especially when you look at the, the deeper problems here, you know, my mother... 95 years old now, uh, living in the same house I grew up with, grew up in New York and New Jersey, um, was a therapist, family therapist in her career. And she was fond of saying that the presenting problem is not the problem. And this is a classic case. Uh, the presenting problem is the reform. The deeper problems are wide and they are multifaceted. Um, it's not just right and left. That's the least of it, because there are people on the right who are part of the opposition, so including people to the right of Netanyahu, like Gidon Saar. Um, it is not just uh, center and periphery, Greater Tel Aviv versus the, you know, the outer lying communities. Not many demonstrations taking place in Kiryat Shmona or in Sterot or in Afikim. Not many. Most of them are in the center cities. Um, it is um, Ashkenazi versus Sephardi or, or Mizrahi. That's very, very deep. Um, I belong, I'm active in a community here in Jaffa in southern Tel Aviv. Um, majority of the people in the, my community are Mizrahi, many of them are working class. And they tell me this is, the reform is not about, um, it's not about democracy. It's not about freedom. It's about, uh, for put it in American terms, about white privilege. And that, uh, it's a Ashkenazi elite sort of rallying around the last bastion of Ashkenazi power, which is the Supreme Court and refusing to accept the outcome of the last elections. And I hear that all the time. Most of my building where I'm talking to you is French and the French Jews think exactly that overwhelmingly. Um, I think the, the deepest schism is between what I call the normal Israel and the abnormal Israel. So the normal Israel is one you know well. It, it was a vision that to which many of the founders of this country held that someday the Jewish state would be like any other state. We'd be the Jewish state like, the, like Ireland is Irish, Irish or, you know, Bulgaria is Bulga Bulgarian. 
um, and that, yes, we'd have a Jewish calendar, we'd speak Hebrew, we'd have holidays, but eventually we'd be, I don't know, sort of a Sweden on the banks of the Mediterranean. With, or but know, Herzl certain, wanted Vienna on the Mediterranean. Or something like that. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major stream in early Zionist thought, the, to normalize the Jewish people. But then there's the abnormal Jews. And the abnormal Jews said, you know, 4,000 years ago, Abraham said to, God said to Abraham, guess what? You're not going to be normal. You're not going to be like everybody else. And what has distinguished and preserved the Jewish people for the last 4,000 years is our abnormality. And then why these abnormal Israelis say, why would we finally have a Jewish state? We want it to be a normal state. We want it to be a Jewish state. This is a fundamental division within Israeli society. And to make even sort of matters worse, um, our Arab neighbors have had the temerity, the chutzpah, to make peace with us. And so this great external pressure called the Arab-Israeli conflict has fallen away. And so the visions have risen to the top. We can afford to be divided right now. We actually can't be, but that's the impression. Uh, we still face existential threats from Iran and its proxies. But, uh, and so these are the real threats of dividing Israeli society. And the question ultimately is not whether uh, the government will determine, you know, who will be appointed to the Supreme Court. The fundamental issues are, are who are we? What do we mean when we say we are the nation state of the Jewish people? What, what causes our cohesion? What binds us together? Do we share a common destiny? These are very fundamental and pressing issues that we have to address now, because in 25 years from now, I, I, I fear it'll be too late. Yeah, well, I, I think we, we got a taste of this culture war a couple of years ago earlier when the nation state law was passed. You address this in your book. Why was what you referred to um, as essentially a tautology, you know, saying that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people, why was it so controversial? And why do you think um, Israelis and Jews elsewhere should, you know, sort of be thinking about this and, you, as you say, to sort of redefining their identity uh, in a way that can bring Jews together? Well, the complaints against the nation state law was that it, it, it appeared that people thought that it relegated uh, Israeli Arabs to a second class citizenship. Uh, it didn't recognize the, the equal status of Arabic language with Hebrew language. Uh, there were a number of complaints. Um, the Federation, the American Jewish Federations, came to me at the time and said, we objected to Article 7, which also seemed to downgrade Israel diaspora relations. Uh, there are many, many complaints. My principal problem with the nation set law, and I voted for it, I want to be very clear about that, um, with all sorts of reservations that one has being in politics, um, was that nobody understood it. And as you mentioned, I, 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 I call it in the book, I call it a, a tautological law because it's stating the opposite. Yeah, Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. The problem is not the tautology. The problem is what does that mean to be the nation state of the Jewish people? Does that mean we are, as Israel, we responsible for Jewish continuity of the diaspora? Should we be contributing more to Jewish schools? Are we responsible for Jewish uh, safety and security of the diaspora? Should we be sending uh, ag uh, graduates of the IDF uh, to guard synagogues and day schools? Uh, in the United States. I mean, there are precedents for this, you know, the 1976 Entebbe raid. The IDF was sent out to to defend Jews, to save Jews. During the airlifts from Ethiopia, it was Israeli special forces uh, who airlifted those Jews. So there are precedents for that, but it wasn't clear. And I extrapolate from this um, uh, the problems I have with the fact that the state of Israel, for example, has not recognized the major streams of Judaism in the United States, uh, I think I made a particular painful point that uh, after the, the Tree of Life massacre in Pittsburgh, um, many Israeli politicians would actually not call the Tree of Life a synagogue uh, because the state of Israel did not recognize conservative Judaism. And that was painful. Uh, these are people who had died at the hands of a vicious anti-Semite because they were Jews. And I think that we really have to have a discussion about what it means um, to be the nation state of the Jewish people, of the people. It's a national identity. I mean, it, it, it should not um, delve into how Jews outside of Israel practice or choose not to practice their Judaism. Yeah, well, I think that goes um, to what you've been saying about the, the judicial reform fight as well. It's about, you know, it, it, what, what does it mean to have a, a Jewish state? And obviously the different, the competing factions there have very different ideas about that. And... Um, which is really at the heart of that battle. But let's move on to the question that you've already mentioned, which is 
um, one of the key problems um, which you discussed, which is the future of the growing Haredi sector, which you state in very stark terms as one potentially involving national suicide. You note that there are some sides of progress towards more integration of the economy and national service, but that overall these are not sufficient to cause you to be optimistic about that. So how does Israel deal with this without, as you also, I think, wisely say, employing coercion, which will definitely not work? Coercion won't work. It simply won't work. Listen, I've had, I had the honor and, um, and, and I would say the, 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 the serendipity, if you will, uh, of being the first Israeli ambassador to meet, albeit clandestinely, uh, with the Haredi leadership of the United States. And the first thing I learned was that there is no Haredi uh, community. There are Haredi communities, and they are very different. There are communalities, but very different. And that, uh, and that they have found models for integrating uh, young Haredim into the economy that Israel could emulate. Uh, the Haredi, pop, Haredi schools, institutions, uh, in New York particularly, are graduating hundreds and sometimes thousands of professionals um, into law, medicine, uh, all the you know all the that the 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 lucrative fields that support this community, and they remain Haredim. The last thing I'm asking for Haredim is to stop being Haredim. In fact, I open up my discussion by saying my great respect for a population, probably the only one in the world that is voluntarily impoverished for what it believes, and by the way, impervious to economic incentives. When uh, Mr. Netanyahu was the Treasury. Uh, a minister uh, some years back, and he cut child subsidies. Uh, the Arab population growth plummeted. The Haredi population growth went up. <laughs> it's just impervious. So that it says a lot about this community and their commitment to family and their commitment to tra tradition. But there is not a zero sum game here. They can have those big families. They can probably even have bigger families uh, and be a part of the economy. Uh, because what's going to happen is, and one of the statistics that I'm very interested in following is the gap between um, the tax base, the people in Israel who actually pay the taxes, and the percentage of the taxes they pay. So some now it's around about 16% of Israelis pay 90% of the taxes. But as the Haredi population continues to grow, it's going to be 12% of the Israeli population paying 95% of the taxes. And at a certain point, and we're very near that point right now, that 12% is going to say, no, we're not going to do this anymore. And, uh, and then that begins to become a strategic slash existential threat. Um, Put simply, with half the population uh, unable to participate in a modern economy, certainly a highly innovative technological society, uh, this country will not be able to sustain itself, much less defend itself if these same people are not going in the army. Um, and so I say this without any animus uh, toward the Haredim, on the contrary, but I say it out of love for the state of Israel. This is what we need to do to survive, and it's not as with so many of these these issues, Jonathan, it, it's not rocket science. Give them an education. Give them an education. Yeah, I think that's that's very well put. Um, the problem is is that so much of the discussion about this uh, that we're hearing sort of in the streets in Israel and even from op-ed uh, pundits in the United States about this seems to sort of engage in sort of a, a sort of a politics of what I would call a politics of contempt. Um, we're talking about sort of the good Israelis versus the bad Israelis, and the 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 productive the good you know the productive people and the sort of the deplorables, and that I think is sort of driving making the, you know these issues whether it's judicial reform or anything else that's really driving polarization as well as polarization between you know diaspora Jews and Israel. I, I couldn't agree with you more. One of the great fears I have here is the politicization of, his, of, a, of his, the Americanization of Israeli politics. And as we become increasingly polarized, uh, we've losing the ability to talk to one another, to listen to the other side. Um, you know, I, I've seen, as you said, these pundits after pundits in the United States, particularly in the pages of the New York Times. Yeah, we you know, know what we're talking some, about. <laughs> you know, making you know, day after day the case against against the government reform. Some of their arguments are very cogent, I have to say. But if I'm reading it through the eyes of someone in my neighborhood. What I'm seeing is not necessarily a cogent argument, but I'm seeing class, a class and ethnic solidarity, and which would be very politically incorrect in the United States, but no one's you know not aware of it here. Um, ethnic and class solidarity, and uh, and not a deep attention, not really attempt to understand these these very deep problems, which are the real problems uh, here, and and those in the long run, the ones that truly destabilize the state of Israel. Yeah, now. 
economics, which encompasses the high cost of living, the housing shortage, um, that's something that most Israelis think are challenges that are not being addressed and is really at the top of their priority list. But how can any government of the future or the present deal with them in a way that is politically viable? I mean, that, that's the interesting question. How, you know, as you say, none of the, all the solutions to all the problems you list, you know, they're not rocket science. But they might as well be if you can't get 61 votes for it and if you can't get a national consensus, even if you have 61 votes. Well, I, talk, I, I, I spend a lot of time in this book talking about political reform, not just economic reform, not just social reform, and the ways we have to adapt a system of a bicameral house, a local representation. I was in Knesset for years living in Jaffa, but I was not the distinguished representative from Jaffa. I had a national constituency, as we all had. And, uh, and that's important for people in your own neighborhood to come to complain to you about the sewer system. Um, and we didn't have that. We don't have that recourse in the state of Israel. So there are many, many reforms that have to take place. Generally speaking, the, the problem with Israeli's economy is that it's not that it's, uh, you know, not that it's a socialist economy, not that it's a capitalist economy, but that it is a, it is a monopolist economy. And great monopolies control the banking system, control the import and export of food. Uh, and there have been repeated attempts to break up these monopolies, sometimes successful. Uh, uh, the use of cell phones, a cell phone that used to cost hundreds and hundreds of shekels a month, now it costs 40 shekels a month because that monopoly was broken up. Um, and, but you know, still, the monopoly over import. We have the second most expensive uh, grocery basket of any country in the world after Japan. Uh, we're also an island, uh, not sea-bound, but we are an island. We have to import 90% of our food. Um, we have the largest income gap in the world between rich and poor of any country outside the United States, Chile, and Mexico. We have a million kids beneath the poverty line. This is a Jewish state. To me, that's untenable uh, for a Jewish state. And so we have severe economic problems. About 12% of the population is involved in high tech, and it's great. And that 12% has given us an average GDP, which is now passing Japan's. We've already passed Italy. We're closing in on Germany. Uh, we are in an affluent, strong country but with the social gap, because outside the 12%, uh, people are not partaking in the fruits of that, that, uh, that innovative explosion, and uh, not much trickle down here. And people have to make do, I actually don't know how they make it, and don't, on the salaries that they get. And, uh, and you're right, it's, it's extraordinary that this hasn't been the, the paramount uh, political issue, certainly the paramount electoral issue in Israel, because uh, all polls, polls show that what Israelis care most about is the cost of living, even more than security now. And yet no major political party, party in the last elections ran on a strong economic program. Now that's going to have to change. Um, and Israelis are going to have to demand that it's changed. One of the, uh, the book is predicated on, the, uh, on my understanding about how change comes about in a society. It doesn't change come about because some member of Knesset wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I want to make a change. It happens because there's a knock on the door that wakes up the member of Knesset, and she goes to the door outside of a thousand people that says, "If you don't make this change, we're not we're not going to reelect you." Uh, and people have just not come to Israeli politicians yet and say, "Listen, if you don't get the cost of living down, we're not going to reelect you." And uh, I think that's coming too. I think it's also coming. People are going to say, "If you're going to keep on giving money to the Haredi school system and investing in our future," devastation, we're not going to vote for you. Uh, there are many going to be issues now. Again, Yamamoto, uh, there's been a sleeping giant awakened here. We're going to see that giant begin to get out of bed. Well, um, I, I suppose that could take the form of you know, pressure on some of the parties of the center or center left to sort of make their peace with Netanyahu and the Likud. I mean, just to get you know micro as opposed to macro for a moment. And yet that doesn't seem... That doesn't seem very possible um, right now, <laughs> right? I, I always quote a, an old professor of mine, Asher Arian, uh, Allah uh, Shalom, a uh, great American. He was the first professor of Israeli politics. And I once asked him in a Hillel-like fashion, what's the one rule of Israeli politics that you could teach me while I'm standing on one leg that I have to know? And uh, without, a hard, without a hesitation, he said, um, Israeli politicians will always prefer collective to individual suicide. Yeah, that makes Set. sense. <laughs> I rest the case. Yeah, that Set. makes sense. Well, yeah. going on, as we go through some of um, the things that you wrote about, 
I was particularly struck by your discussion of the future of Israeli Arabs. Now, in most of the foreign media, they're, ref they're referred to now as Palestinians, not Israeli Arabs, though I, I think that most of them really want to be Israeli, as far as I know. How does a Jewish state... Most of them want to be Israelis. Polish. Yeah, right. How does a Jewish state successfully integrate such a large national minority that is divided between pragmatists like Mansour Abbas and ideologues who are truly unreconciled to the state's existence. Uh, you say it's a challenge that requires both sides to change, but how does that happen? How does that work? Well, first let me say at the outset that it already is happening. That is actually one of the more <laughs> optimistic fields, believe it or not. Uh, because here, I'll give you an example. 20 years ago, uh, with the outbreak of the Second Intifada, uh, Israeli Arabs protested against the presence of Israeli police in their villages. They're protesting again because they want more police, not fewer police. They're protesting again because they want faster and deeper integration into Israeli society. Um, so it's already happening. And you can go to a university like Haifa, which is 50% Arab. You can go to entire fields like pharmacology, which are Arab. Um, and slowly, uh, ineluctably, Israeli Arabs have become more Arab. P.S. is where the society has become more Middle Eastern at the same time. We're meeting somewhere in the middle. I'm told, I, I don't, I can't verify this, that um, Israeli Arabic is becoming uh, gradually more un unintelligible to Arabs elsewhere uh, in the Middle East because Israeli Arabic is so sprinkled in spice with Hebrew terms. I mean, I hear it all the time, but I don't know the degree that it's unintelligible. Um, and so, yes, um, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news was still far away. And uh, here, what I in the book, I talk about the New Deal. It's a very American term. It doesn't translate very well uh, into uh, Hebrew. Um, but the New Deal is this. Um, the, of the 194 states in the world, most of them are nation states. And in those nation states, a great number of them have large national, non, large non-national minorities. And in the overwhelming majority of those cases, those national majorities are, are loyal minorities. The example I give, strangely enough, is Anglo Jewry. Uh, the quarter of a million Jews who live in the United Kingdom salute a flag that has not one but three crosses on it. They sing a national anthem to the to the head of the Church of England, <laughs> God save him. They may have been willing to salute that flag, to fight for that flag, to give their lives for that flag. So th there are models in the world. I see no reason why Israeli Arabs can't salute our flag and fight for our flag. And, uh, and sort of this notion that Arabs don't fight Arabs is kind of belied on a daily basis throughout the Middle East. Um, so I, I see no reason. But the, the, new, the New Deal has two sides, and that is Israeli Arabs have to acknowledge their place as a loyal minority of the state of Israel. They will receive full equal rights, but those equal rights have to be truly enforced. It's not enough that we fight discrimination. We say we fight discrimination. We condemn uh we just end racism, certainly not today, with uh, members of this current government who are rather openly racist. Um, we have to fight racism. We have to fight racism in a, a Churchillian sense, in the courtroom, in the classroom, um, certainly in the marketplace, and be very active about it. My model is uh, the civil rights movement to the 60s when I grew up, um, you know, which was uh, had a certain, I think, impressive success, not a complete success by any means, but that's the model. Um, and I'm hopeful. I also talk on a deeper level, about finding a place for the Arabs in our story. You know, our story is the most extraordinary story in, in modern history, perhaps in all of history. And it has proven to be a very flexible history. We have found room in that history for the Druze, for the Circassians, certainly for Ethiopian Jews. We have to have room in our history and our story for, for Israeli Arabs as well. It was very important for me, Jonathan, to put this book out in English, in Hebrew, and in Arabic. And uh, the Arabic translation is very good. Well, that's uh, that. That is, you know, that sums it up. Um, the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, you know, is key to Israel, to Israeli life. It's an institution that's central to the country's culture and society. But you ask in the book, how can it truly remain a citizen's army with so many people not serving? And that's not just the Arabs and the Haredim. And there, there is a rise in people not serving even among the sort of secular Jewish population. Where is the answer there? Um, and and you, you speak of the growing debate within sort of the high levels of uh, the Israeli military where they, you know, they'd sort of want a volunteer army um, might be easier for them to deal with. But you outline the problems that would happen if that were the choice. 
Well, the Israeli army is one of our great, great accomplishments. It's, it, it is, believe it or not, more than twice as large as the British and French armies combined today. It is the second largest citizens' army in the world after South Korea's, and it's an actual combat uh, army. And uh, it is just more than an army, as you know. It's it's an absorption machinery. It's a it's the melting pot. It's an educational institution. I, I became Israeli through the army. They threw me in there, and I barely knew a word of Hebrew. I certainly didn't know the parts of a gun. And uh, and I became an Israeli. It was my melting pot. And I met Israelis from different parts of the society I never would have met. I never would have met otherwise, Jews and non-Jews. And uh, and yet and yet, as you mentioned, there's a a growing uh, body of opinion, including among them se former senior officers from the IDF who say that, that this is a myth, that the Israeli army is no longer a citizen's army. About 60% of all eligible uh, candidates do, do not serve in that military. And only 25% of eligible candidates serve in the reserves. And uh, that we should just recognize this reality and begin to adopt a more American model of an all-volunteer army. And my response to this has been uh, very visceral, very opposed. Um, not only will we knew, we use all this, the, the, the great social um, and economic benefits of the Israeli army, uh, that integration, the absorption, the melting pot, we'll also lose our technological edge um, because you know, in the United States, an eight-year-old whiz kids and computers isn't going into the infantry, isn't going to the intelligence corps. Um, he or she's going off to Stanford and then off to Silicon Valley and to make a lot of money, whereas we get the whiz kids, and we get them for at least three, four years, sometimes longer. And after they've been in the Army, and the Army, by the way, I'm told, is about eight years ahead of the most advanced computer science department on Earth. The Israeli Army is ahead of them by eight years. They come out and they develop ways and they develop mobile eye, uh, which gives us our great uh, technological edge and our very high average GDP. Um, we will lose that with an all volunteer army. That all volunteer army will be gay, will be made up in the soldiery of people from the periphery, a lot of minorities. The the professional officer corps will be drawn increasingly, probably from the yeshivot, from the religious schools, and um, and that army's willingness to fight the way citizens fight, I think, will be very, very different, very different. It just it's it's, it's interesting to note, and I think disturbing to note the degree to which the politicization of the army uh, during the current uh, crisis is actually contributing, is strengthening the debate of those who want to see it, the IDF transformed into, a, into an all-volunteer army. Why? Because the army has been politicized now. And it is, a, a, I think, a dangerous precedent. Five years from now, we can have a very different government. We can have a left-of-center government. We could have a peace process. Israeli government's called to give up territory, say in Judea and Samaria, and half of our officer corps today wears a kippah, is religious, and they could easily say no. I think if they try to pull off the withdrawal from Gaza of 2005 today, half the army would say no. So we have that, that uh, we have the downside of a citizen's army is that the citizen's army has to operate on the basis of consensus. And some people will say, well, we can't get that consensus anymore. We might as well professionalize the army. And it will be once again above politics. So I think that's so we've we've come to a, a very challenging slash dangerous juncture. Yeah, I think what you've just raised is is a very important point about the sort of the protests of uh, some reservists saying they won't serve if judicial reform is passed or elements of it. Um, and um, that's a very unfortunate precedent because if that stands, you know, if that if basically if they get away with that, then what's to stop? You know, as you say, you know, uh, you know, the nationalist, religious Jews who are in the army from doing the same thing at some point down the line. You know, every time somebody wins an election, they think it's the end of the world or the beginning of a thousand year right. But there are, you know, <laughs> there may well be a, another left wing government in Israel's future. You know, um, you know, demography isn't necessarily destiny. And, you know, I, I think the, uh, the the precedent that has been set here is. And, and the way that it's being, you know, cheered uh, by elements of the, you know, uh, the left. I mean, Haaretz even wrote an article that said this is uh, this is a military coup and we're for it. Oh, I understand that. I'm certainly, I hear it all the time here. But um, there's also another element, which is it deepens the concern, if you can imagine that. Who are the officers uh, and uh, reservists who are refusing to serve, refusing to prop for, for duty is overwhelmingly... Uh, 
members of elite units, whether it be pilots um, from the intelligence corps, from the commando units, and all of those units are drawn uh, overwhelmingly from that same sort of upper crust, if you will, Ashkenazi, a secular part of Israeli society. So uh, the, the, the grunts, if you will, of the Golani Brigade and uh, the paratroopers who are drawn from the periphery uh, they are not refusing to serve in large numbers. So there's also a class and ethnic element even to this. Mm, that's, uh, that is troubling. Um, I, I think you're quite accurate in the book in describing uh, the foolishness of Israeli policies, and you've already mentioned this today, which seem designed to alienate the vast majority of American Jews who are not Orthodox. But when I speak to most Israelis, um, I still don't sense that many of them, including including some uh, many on the secular left who should be most sympathetic to arguments about religious pluralism, consider it a priority. And those on the right, um, even those who you know mean well about American Jewry aren't necessarily contemptuous. They just dismiss American Jews as a lost cause. Um, I had a guess on last week that more or less did that. Um, why the disconnect here? Well, American Jews don't... Uh don't know reform conservative Judaism. Reform in Judaism in particular doesn't speak to uh, to many Israeli Jews. It's very alien to them. Um, and at the end of the day, what it is is a, a, a defect in our sense of peoplehood. You know, it's interesting. Um, I was, uh, uh, for a while, Israel's representative on the birthright board. And it was extraordinary to watch that some of the biggest impact of, of birthright was not on American or diaspora Jewish kids, but on Israeli youth. You know, the soldiers who accompanied the bus, because this was their first encounter with Jewish peoplehood. Um, before, you know, if they served with the Druze uh, compatriots in the army or with a Bedouin tracker, you know, I got more in common with Muhammad than I got with Cousin Josh in, in Long Island. You know, who is this guy? Why do I have anything in common with him? So birthright was a huge uh, opener, and I worked very strong to greatly increase the number of Israelis participating in birthright. It goes back to what we talked about, the problem with the nation-state law, is that we, we, we do not understand, certainly not, maybe partially, certainly not fully, the meaning of what we call ourselves, which is the nation-state of the Jewish people. And you can, you know, a, a, an Israeli Jew who doesn't fast on Yom Kippur, has contempt for, you know, for the laws of Kashrut and Shabbat, uh, can somehow feel alienated from a an, is an American Jew who goes to a Reform synagogue and feels himself very observant in a Reform way. Um, and what binds us, again, we come back to this word, what binds us, this question, what binds us at the end of the day has to be peoplehood. Peoplehood, because it's not going to be culture, not going to be language, it's not even a certain way going to be safe. It has to be people with the sense that we share a common history, we share a common destiny. Uh, and I think that's a point that I, I reiterate uh, in this book. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's very well said, and uh, I agree. Um, and we have to, do, we have to speak more about that. Um, I think your book is also very much on target when it discusses Israel's foreign policy challenges. One is the dependence on the United States, which has become more of a, an argument uh, lately. And the other is um, not so much discussed, but which is finding a way to navigate during what is clearly becoming a second Cold War between the United States and China. How does Israel assert its autonomy while still needing a superpower ally, while also not wishing to be drawn into the conflict with China? Now, all I could say is, you know, first of all, this has been the sort of a late motif of our history. Uh, we most most peoples have a, a have a national book, which is a book of of heroism and and triumph. But we have a book of of failure <laughs> and exile that tells us everything we go wrong. And and probably the principal thing we do go wrong it is is failure to navigate successfully between empires. And uh, in the ancient world, we fell afoul of the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and and finally the Romans disastrously. Um, we didn't navigate very well. And this has been this has been our sort of fate throughout history to be a small nation, though a very you know a powerful in our own way, um, but one that really has to tiptoe uh, through these minefields of international and geo, uh, geopolitics. Um, and today, uh, even more pressingly than during the Cold War, um, it is it is really complex. We're living not in a bipolar world, but a multipolar world. 
and an emerging conflict between uh, the United States and, and China. Whereas Israel, you know, China, I would go so far, I wouldn't say it's a friendly state, it's a frenemy state. Uh, it, uh, on one hand, is, has, doesn't have any anti-Semitism. It's building our northern and southern ports. It's building the subway across the street from my house and keeping me awake at night. You get up in the morning here, Jonathan, six o'clock in the morning, it looks like Shanghai. All the people with yellow helmets and bicycles. Um, and, you know, half the cranes in this city, and they're all over the place, you know, the crane is our national bird here. Uh, half those cranes have Chinese signs on them. So th the Chinese are here. The Chinese are here economically, uh, but they're also here strategically. They have built the largest naval base in Africa at the Horn of, uh, of Djibouti. That it controls the entrance to, to the Red Sea. They're built, importantly building bases on the Persian Gulf. Um, if I had my, you know, if I were a betting man, I'd say they were, they were going to rebuild Syria in the coming years. There's like a $300 billion price tag for rebuilding Syria. The Russians can't do it. The Iranians can do it. The Chinese can do it. They're here. They're here at a time when America is pulling out everywhere. And China has actually surpassed the United States as a, tr as a trading partner for Israel. So all of this is, you know, we, we can't ignore it. On the other hand, China backs our enemies. China votes against us in the UN. China does not aid us every year. China does not cast those vetoes. China does not share our democratic values. China is not home to the, the other largest Jewish community in the world. All these different factors. Uh, there's no replacement for the United States as our ultimate ally, uh, irrespective of you know, America's changing position in the world. And so we have to navigate. And we have to navigate smartly and with sensitivity and with an eye to the future uh, all the time. And I have sat through... I've sat through meetings with three different administrations, Republican and Democratic alike, where we have been excoriated for our relationship with China. And uh, uh, so far as uh, representatives of the administration say that the U.S. Sixth Fleet would not visit Haifa if the Chinese were going to build Haifa port. And I understood them. I did understood. Um, and again, it's going to cause, it's going to be, it is cause for extreme helmsmanship here on the part of our leaders. Yeah, I think that's, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I, we've been talking a lot lately, those of us who care about Israel, about, you know, aid to Israel from the United States, and we can get into that. But I don't think Israelis really understand, especially how many of their supporters in the United States are, you know, very much up in arms about China, see China as really, as I said, you know, the adversary in a new Cold War, not quite you know, replicating the old Cold War because they're so economically involved in the United States as well, but still a geopolitical rival. And, you know, that that's a real issue. I don't think many Israelis have, uh, you know, they haven't wrapped their brains around the fact that Americans, you know, are very, you know, upset about this. On the other hand, not many Israelis have understood the changing role of America. Um, I had an article in the Israeli press two days ago where I, I remarked that it's now been 10 years, believe it or not, since I returned from Washington. And I returned from Washington with a message for our leaders. And when the message was, was rather harsh. I said, uh, guys, we're on our own. Uh, this is not the America that, that we knew. It wasn't the America that sent Marines to get me out of Lebanon in 1982, 1983. It's not that America anymore. Um, George Bush sent 600,000 soldiers into Iraq and Afghanistan 20 years ago. I don't know if the President of the United States can send 600 soldiers anywhere today. Very different. Um, America, it's, it's, a, it's a source of bipartisan, I think, agreement uh, on isolationism, not getting involved in foreign wars. I think that even President Biden's support for, you, for the Ukraine uh, opposition um, is going to be an, an issue in 2024 uh, and be questioned. So... You know, we have to. We have not fully internalized the ramifications of that great um, tectonic shift uh, of the United States pulling back, and uh, and what that means for us and other U.S. allies: Germany, South Korea, uh, Japan. Uh, you talk to to ambassadors for those countries; they sound just like Israelis, you know, who understand these things. And so we have to we have to adjust. Now, the good news is we are not uh, the same country we were in 1982. We're much stronger. We're able to stand on our own two feet much more. But we have to begin to re-examine our relationship with this new United States. And one of those issues is re-examining the aid relationship. And I've, I've written about it, spoken about it. I was the only member of the Israeli government back in 2016 who opposed uh, the, Obama, the Obama aid package uh, for many reasons, not the least of which was the fact that I thought he, that the president would give us aid and then condemn us in the UN, and he did. Um, but um, it wasn't fine of giving that cover 
but uh, there are fundamental reasons why things have shifted, and not the least of which is that uh, we are a strong and, and affluent country, and that relationship of, of sort of receiving a handout uh, is no longer, I think, uh, respectable for us. It's the wrong message to our enemies. Uh, I would much rather see our relationship with the United States be one of uh, cooperation uh, and partnership on issues that are of mutual um, importance to our security, whether it be in cyber, in AI, in laser technologies, in which Israel has an edge. We maybe they can't con we can't contribute to the same sort of financial level, but certainly intellectually, technologically, we can. We punch way, way above our weight, and so we have what to offer. And I, I. And I know you agree with this. I, um, I cringe when I hear leaders in the United States, public figures, saying that they're willing to use American aid to Israel as a way of arm-twisting us. And I don't think that's a respectable or healthy relationship. Very true. Now, one of the issues that you raise that I think is particularly important is the seeming indifference of many Israelis, including most particularly those in the government who ought to know better and the Ministry of foreign ministry about the danger posed by the BDS movement and the international community, and specifically the UN, to Israel's security. I mean, part of it, as you explain in the book, is traditional Zionist ideology. You know, uh, the, the Jews do, the, the you know, we do, not to care about what the non-Jews do. Uh, but why are Israelis so reluctant to realize the importance of addressing the threat of international isolation, which is, despite successes like the Abraham, Accord, Abraham Accords, Growing, as we've seen with the uh, recent UN, uh, you know, a commission uh, that you know is one step towards you know criminalizing uh, Israel. Well, one problem is that we're not isolated anymore. You know, John Kerry's prognostication, uh, prognostication that uh, Israel that didn't make uh, a Palestinian a Palestinian state would be isolated on steroids, uh, as proven emphatically wrong. Uh, I moved to Israel at a time when we didn't acknowledge we not have peace with. Uh, Jordan and Egypt, we didn't have relations with China, we didn't have relations with India, we didn't have relations with the Soviet bloc, with almost all of Africa, most of South America. I mean, really, uh, today we are exquisitely not isolated, and yet we face the the very, I think, very real threat of sanctions and boycotts, uh, which potentially could take us down. And certainly Hezbollah and Hamas know that they can't destroy us with all of their rockets together. They can ruin our day, but they can't destroy us. What they can get us to do is to fight back kill civilians on their side, and then be condemned for war crimes. They don't have a military um, strategy, Jonathan. They have a military tactic that serves a media, a diplomatic, and ultimately a legal strategy, which is designed to deny us the right to defend ourselves and ultimately deny our right to exist. Uh, and they're very, they're very methodical about it. They do it war after war after war. They chip away at these things. They're great. They're, I, I take my hat off to them in that way. We don't internalize that. First of all, our soldiers aren't taught that. Our, 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 our soldiers uh, are taught, and having been one, I'll tell you, we're taught that what, what, what achieves security for the state of Israel is, um, is audacity and heroism and leadership on the battlefield. Not how we look on CNN. Right? Not how we look in, in social media. That, that's a whole sea change in our, in our outlook. Um, and that's difficult. There's also a growing sense among young Israelis, and I, I can almost sympathize with this, that whatever we do is never going to change. And that the, the world, certainly the Western world, is set against us, and we can explain ourselves as much as possible. We take every possible precaution to avoid inflicting civilian casualties on the other side, and we're still going to be condemned, no matter what. And, you know, having served as both a Oh boy! Having served as the you know, the CNN and CBS analyst, I will tell you, there's Jeff truth to that, and uh, and so the the best I can argument I can give them is the, we can't we may not be able to win this. We certainly can't win it 100, percent but we may be able to win it 50, percent and that 50 percent will provide vital time and space for the IDF to operate. That's what I would tell my staff in Washington during crises. Our job is to gain time and space for the Israeli forces to defend our people. And uh, you know, not necessarily to win hearts and minds uh, you know, profoundly and permanent. So you know, it is, we haven't internalized that the computer and TV screen is every bit of a battlefield as, as Gaza and South Lebanon. Uh, that sums it up. Um, now, that, that leads to my next question, which is the problem of the Palestinians. We, haven't, we barely mentioned them. 
you lay out the problem very clearly in pointing out that the Palestinians are neither willing nor able to make peace with Israel or accept you know, anything less than a fully sovereign state, and even that they won't, they keep saying no to. But as much as you derive the lack of realism of the peace process lobby in the United States, which is still very strong, although it's completely disconnected from reality, you also believe that the current situation shouldn't be allowed to go on indefinitely. Uh, there's a contradiction there. I mean, if the Palestinians haven't shown any sign of accepting reality as the 2019 Trump administration peace plan, which you praise in your book, lays out, you know, over the last 75 or 50 years, what could possibly change their mind in the next 25 or 50 or 100? I will actually um, <laughs> sharpen your question with your permission. Uh, not only, not only are the Palestinians, you know, unwilling to, to sign a peace treaty with us, they don't have what you would call, though the Palestinian leader certainly has the uh, plenipotentiary power to do that. Not Mahmoud Abbas. He has, he's in the 18th year of his four-year term. He won't even stand for re-election, much less sign a peace treaty. Um, no, the question is whether the Palestinian people have the cohesion as a people to actually sustain a nation-state structure. Now, there are thousands of peoples in the world. Very few of them are, st are capable of sustaining a nation-state structure. One of the great miracles of this place is you could take Jews from 70 different nations that don't share a common language and culture, stick them in a country with nat without natural resources, surrounded by adversaries, and we'll create a very high-functioning nation-state because it turns out we actually are a people. I used to say to, to Secretary of State John Kerry, I used to say our big problem is that the Pal that is not that the Palestinians are not a people, it's that they're not enough of a people. And that the, the, I cannot adduce a shred of evidence from the last 130 years that would support the case that the Palestinians are capable of maintaining a state structure. There's plenty of evidence to the contrary. Just look what happened to Gaza after we pulled out. Hamas can't even sustain sovereignty there in a small area. So that is a, a, a tremendous, tremendous worry. So having said all that, how can I then say that we can that the, the current situation has to change? And it can change, but not if we keep beating our heads against a two-state solution, which is an oxymoron which in fact, no Palestinian leader has ever accepted the American formula of two states for two peoples because the Palestinians simply refuse to accept us, the Jews, as a people. Of course, this is, we, are, we have a fabricated history according to them. There was never a temple in Jerusalem. There was never an ancient Jewish kingdom here. Um, these are fundamental problems. Um, how then can we move forward? Well, first of all, stop talking about the two-state solution, the oxymoron. You can talk about a two-state situation because we basically have two states. If you drive up our Highway 6 and look to your right going north, you'll see Palestinian flags flying over major cities. They have a government. They have an army of sorts. They collect taxes, albeit often at gunpoint. And uh, you know, they, it's kind of a state. It's not a Bavarian state as we understand it, but a state. We can build on that reality. It's what I call the two-state reality. We can build on it. We can build on it by giving greater autonomy to the Palestinians, uh, greater room to uh, certainly to build, we can uh, look at alternative formula, uh, federal solutions, cantonment, trusteeships. There's so many different ways we can move that can provide horizons for Israelis and Palestinians together, um, but we will never get anywhere under the current, you know, idée fix of the two-state solution. I had the, I would say, <laughs> The, mis the misfortune of being in charge of the Palestinian issue for the Israeli government for about a year and a half, including Gaza and the West Bank. And I'll tell you, the, the biggest obstacle, the greatest obstacle to en enhancing the lives of Palestinians was the Palestinian Authority. Every program we put forward for, you know, waste, disposal, and reclamation, um, for lowering the prices of imports, of customs duties, was blocked by the Palestinian Authority because they will not because it belied their narrative of suffering under an intolerable Israeli occupation. You can't have the good life in Palestine. That doesn't work. And we saw it happen with the vaccinations. You remember, they were willing, the PA was willing to let its own people die rather than accept uh, vaccinations from the state of Israel. So it's a, we're locked into that formula. And as long as we are, we're not going to get anywhere. And surprisingly, now I've heard from longtime advocates of the two-state solutions quietly behind closed doors that they understand this and that we have to move forward. Mm. Well, uh, let's hope there's more realism. I, there's very little sign of it in uh, the American foreign policy establishment to date, but 
I guess there's hope uh, for anybody. Now, last, um, anyone who has just mentioned so many difficult problems, let alone outlining them in detail in book form as you have done in 2048, uh, would be expected to be a pessimist about Israel's future. But I don't think anyone who reads your book will walk away from it with that idea about you. Um, even though there doesn't seem to be any path to sort of constitutional reform uh, to get a sort of a more, you know, rational Knesset or any of the things that need to happen, what makes you an optimist about Israel in 2048 and why should we share that optimism? So that at the risk of sounding repetitive, uh, it's that personal history and, and my role as a historian. Again, I came here 45 years ago. It's, it's scary to think that. But when I came here, we were a lower middle class agrarian society. Our greatest export was, uh, was orange juice. <laughs> uh, the food was terrible. You know, even the falafel was bad. Uh, we had relations with nobody uh, at war with all of our neighbors. Um, and, you know, it, to see Israel transformed in my lifetime the way it has. Um, the culinary tours start with, I think that's the funniest thing going, that people come here for good food. Uh, the, the innovation, the peace treaties, the recognition, uh, the legitimization of, in the international arena, the, the immigration of nearly a million uh, for, Jews in the former Soviet Union. When I, all throughout my, my youth, uh, a huge chunk of the Jewish people, three million Jews weren't free to see 100,000 Ethiopian Jews come here. These were miracles that I saw you know, with my own two eyes. I didn't read about them in a book. I saw them up close. Um, the emergence of a U.S.-Israel alliance, which I say without reservation, is the deepest and most multifaceted alliance which the United States has had with any foreign power in the post-World War II period. We could do a whole four podcasts just about that. You can't have lived through this without being optimistic. And I've seen this overcome some very seemingly insurmountable obstacles, whether the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War, where the economy was destroyed, uh, a huge part of our population killed, wounded, traumatized. The Second Intifada, five years where we almost lost this country. Um, controversies around the Second and uh, Lebanon War, I mean, pretty much endless. I've seen us overcome it. And that, that's just my personal history. It's, it's the... It's also my perspective as a, as a historian. My next book is going to be out uh, the 1948 war. I have a contract with Random House. And uh, that's going to be a challenge just to capture that story. Think about that story. But uh, I, I look back at what this place looked like on May 14, 1948. With, again, no allies, no resources. Uh, the army came to Ben Gurion and says, don't declare a state because we don't have enough bullets to fight more than a week. Uh, George Marshall, you know, the, the most, I think, prominent American alive said, you guys won't survive two weeks and began to call up hundreds of American reservists to save the Jews of Palestine. Um, and we created this. I mentioned the army. I mentioned the economy. And it's an important point to make. We should never forget this. Israel is one of maybe five countries in the world, Jonathan, that has never known a second of non-democratic governance. It's the United States, the, you know, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Really, almost one hand. And we're the only country on that list that's never known a second of peace. And that has to be one of our towering accomplishments. Along with reviving Hebrew and, and creating a nation. I just read today that uh, three of our universities are in the top 100 universities in the, in the world. The rest are in the top 500. Um, we have more Nobel Prize winners than we have gold medal Olympic winners. <laughs> only a Jewish state would be proud of that. Um, by any international criteria, we are not just a successful country, we're a miraculous country. And yes, we're a miraculous country that faces existential threats, and not just one. But if anything, my personal uh, history and my and our history has proven to me that we're capable of overcoming these things. But it begins by being aware of it and begins by discussing it. And to be cavalier or lackadaisical about it, we will not overcome. And that's my, my, my note of caution. Well, that's, uh, that's very well said. I think anybody with any sense of history should know better than to bet against Israel, and that's a great reminder from you. And that gives us something to look forward to, another uh, big history book from, from Michael Warren is uh, something you. that just, that just uh, cheered me up. Uh, Michael, thanks so much for joining us today and for your fascinating insights on Israel's future. I want to recommend 2048 to our audience. It's an important read, and I hope it gets the broad audience it deserves. I also want to thank our audience. 
please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition. And whether you're listening to us on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, or any of the other podcast platforms, or watching us live on Facebook or Twitter, or on the JNS YouTube channel, please like and or subscribe to Top Story, click on the bell for notifications, and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at jns.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again next week.